I, I want to welcome you. Thank you all for coming to this evening's uh, d uh, discussion of uh, Talk to Me About Mysteries. I'm uh, Pete McGee. I'm the president of the University of Minnesota Friends of the Library, uh, Friends of the University of Minnesota Libraries, uh, which is a co-sponsor of this event. The event is also sponsored by the, uh, now I want to get every word in here right, the Jean Nicholas Treader Collection in Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Studies, and by Quatrefoil Library. So one of the things that we like to do is to co-sponsor with uh, people who are interested in the things that we're sponsoring, and the Treader Collection certainly is a major part of gay and lesbian life here in the Twin Cities. I, um, I want to... Uh, ho I, I want to introduce Lisa Vicoli, who will be the uh, mistress of ceremonies for the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you all for joining us this evening. We're very excited to have you here. Um, I'd also like to give a welcome to Wendy Luget, the university librarian, who uh, hopped on light rail from the airport and came directly to the event this evening. Um, this is a uh, joint program of the Friends of the Minnesota Libraries, the Treader Collection, and Quatrefoil. Quatrefoil is a GLBT community-based lending library, um, and we appreciate their uh, sponsorship, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, Scott Breifogel, who is the uh, president or chair of the board of Quatrefoil, and thank you for being here for tonight and for your contribution. There's information on Quatrefoil, on the Treader Collection, and on Friends of the Library in the lobby, um, and it will all be available after the presentation this evening. We'll hope you'll take a little bit of time to look that look over that. Um, I could tell you a lot about RD and Ellen, um, about the awards they've won, the books they've written, 46 at this point and counting. Um, so if you are not familiar with these authors, you're in for a treat, because if you're like me, there's nothing better than finding an author with a big body of work that you love and you've never read, because there's just books. <laughs> Um, so I hope that you will enjoy this. They've agreed to kind of have a conversation with each other and essentially let us listen in on their conversation. Um, so we will get to do that. And then uh, in a bit, we'll have time for some questions. So if things strike you during their conversation or if there are things that you would like to ask, please keep that in mind. Um, and in a little bit, um, I'll come back up and we'll have a chance to ask questions. Afterwards, we'll have a reception. Books are for sale and they'll be signing books as well. So they've been very generous with their time. And I will get out of the way and turn it over to the two of you. Thank you both for being here this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is this on? Is this on? Hold it up close. Is this on? No. No. Oh. <laughs> I can check out. Well, then I get to ask the first question of Ellen, since she's a little slower. So um, we were talking the other day. We used to do a lot of programs together, and we haven't in, in, a, in a long time, so it's a pleasure to be here. And it's a real thrill to be here at the uh, university li uh, libraries. We were just downstairs in the archives, which were just utterly fascinating, down in the caverns. Is that? We got, it was like 80 feet down. Anyways, so Ellen and I were talking the other day about what we would do, and uh, we came up with some questions to ask each other. And um, But we always... People always ask, and I'll ask Ellen, how long have you been writing, and how many books have you done, and you know, what's your background, and how did you get into writing, all of that. Just give us an overview. Okay, that'll take about half an hour, and so. <laughs> and I don't have to say anything. No, no. I just have to say this is such a joy. We used to do things together all the time, RD and I, and I've always called him my best writing buddy. And um, this is, you know, we haven't done anything together in probably ten years. No, we just talk about what we're cooking for dinner. We do, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I called him up once uh, and I said, am I interrupting you? And he said, oh, interrupt me. Ask me what color I'm socks I'm wearing. <laughs> it's you don't have a water cooler if you're a writer and you don't have, so you don't have, you, you can't gather around the water cooler with your other, the people who are doing the same thing you are. And so everybody is sort of on their own talking to each other on the phone, which we do a lot still. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. First question, which, um, I've been writing, you've been writing longer than I have. Yeah, but you started, I think I met you right when your first book was coming out, yeah. over at Once Upon a Crime. Right. And that was 1989. 89. 89, yeah. 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 We thought his name was Artie. As in, <laughs> I've never heard the name Artie. Anyway, um, yeah. Um, and I can just say that he was already a big time published author when I met him. And I went to, um, do you all remember when it used to be called UMBA, the Upper Midwest Booksellers Association na na Annual Convention? I went to that convention the first year that I had a book out. And he had a book from 
I would imagine uh, Del Delacorte, yeah. And he just reached behind this this pile and gave and picked up one of the books and gave it to me. And I just thought he is the coolest guy. <laughs> That was the coolest thing I had ever seen. My fleeting moment of power. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, and then you will you can talk. I I've, I've been writing f since about 1987. First published in 1989. Um, I remember when I published my first book, the press said, "Are you going to write another one?" And I thought, "Oh, okay." <laughs> I knew nothing about publishing when I started, um, and I I truly think that there are a lot of people who love to write excuse me, that, that love to read, that harbor a secret desire to write. And that's who I was back in the 80s. Um, and I finally wrote a book and was lucky enough to get it published. And um, I can remember going to sleep that first night after I saw the book in the bookstore. And I was wondering, you know, if there was going to be a pool in my future. You know, I was thinking about what Oprah, I'd say to Oprah. <laughs> and, you know, none of that. <laughs> it's just, but... Um, being published is a bit like being struck by lightning these days, and and it and it's been an, an incredible ride, an incredible odyssey, um, and I'm working on my 29th book now. Uh, I mean, Ellen is one of the longest going. I mean, you, you're one of the steadiest writing authors I've ever met. Uh, is that good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> no, you are. Uh, it's amazing uh, the contracts that you get and the the amount of uh, just the regularity with which you do it. It's fabulous. Um, I started writing actually when I was a teenager, when I was 17, and um, and I just something that you said. I don't think I've ever thought about it that way. I'm a, a writer who likes to write but doesn't like to read. Isn't that terrible? Uh, you know, I I, um, I have a hard time reading uh, fiction because it's like, why is that period there? Why is that comma there? Why did that? Why did their editor let them do this? Why couldn't I do that? Why are they so great? Why am I such an idiot? You know, you think about all this stuff. So it's very difficult for me to read fiction, uh, particularly, especially when I'm writing. Um, but I started writing... Um, when I was in high school and then in college uh, I came up here uh, I followed my girlfriend who turned also out to be gay uh, to McAllister it was how I ended up here uh, at Michigan uh, at McAllister or how I ended up here in the Twin Cities I'm from Chicago and um, uh, I just kept writing and I was a double at a double major of uh, Russian language and creative writing and I never thought that the two would meet uh, I had to, uh, I, when I graduated, I got one of the few jobs in Russian language. It was either work for the National Security Agency and, tran and do transcripts or to get a job working in the Soviet Union. And uh, I was in the closet then, which I had to be to be get a, a high security clearance. Uh, and I was in the Soviet Union. I had a little bit of trouble with the, the KGB. And so I started writing about it, and I'd never thought about my... I'd written two very unpublishable and horrible books in college, but I finished them. And uh, uh, I started writing a spy thriller when I was in Russia in 1978, and then uh, I finished it, uh, which I think is one of the main things that you have to have to be a successful writer is your ability to finish things because there's so many wonderful writers out there that sit down and do can write beautiful sentences but they can't pull it together and and complete the whole thing um and i published i sold that book uh 30 years ago this month actually in december 1982 and uh it would, came out in 1984 as a paperback original called The Cross and the Sickle. And it was such a buzz. To get, I, mean, I raced over to town, what is it, downtown St. Paul, Town Square? Mm -hmm. B. Dalton's there, and there was the first book I've, of mine I saw on Iraq. But um, anyway, so I've done um, uh, a total of 23 books, I believe. Uh, 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 a number of them under my own name, Zimmerman. I did some kids' books under the name M. Masters, uh, and then I've done some Russian historical novels uh, under the name Robert Alexander, uh, The Kitchen Boy, uh, is probably the best known of those. So, you know, it's been, and now the whole publishing world universe is different. Hey, you don't need glasses for these. This, you did big type. Yeah. 
I, my, my eyesight is going very quickly. I was thinking, oh, good. I don't, this is 200. I mean, this is big print. I yeah. can read this. It helps. <laughs> you want me to ask another question? Yeah, you. Well, you urge. My turn? Yeah. All right. Um, th another question that I think Mr. Redders get asked a lot is, you know, there's a wide world of writing out there. Why did you choose the mystery and thriller genre? Um, why did I, ch you know, I, I like a good story well told. And um, when I read something, I like to be carried away by it. And I think that uh, mysteries and thrillers do that. They have a purpose. And you have to know that purpose of what the book is about within the first, if not the first paragraph, then certainly, of course, the first chapter. And I think that's the joy of reading a mystery or a thriller is to hook you and I like being hooked and I like being pulled along and maybe that's because I'm a difficult reader uh, you know I like I need something to grab me I have no patience if a story's not going by uh, page 50 or books not going by page 25 I'll put it down uh, and won't finish it and I have no uh, but mysteries you know you you can tell what the ride is and I I like I like the genre uh, because I like to read to be entertained uh, I like to be taken away, and I think that that is the the big thing. You know, I mean, you can add things on top of that, like, you know, learning about different places and different cultures. But to get on, on that boat of a mystery or a thriller and say, I'm going to keep you up at night. I'm going to not let you go till I'm done with you. Uh, you know, that, that to me is fun. What about you for that? Um, I think the reason, you know, there are a number of reasons why I... I I think I started out writing mysteries. Number one, I'd always read mysteries. I love mysteries. I read Nancy Drew as a kid. I read Sherlock Holmes, um, the, the entire Sherlock Holmes canon. I have a terrible memory, so I could read those over and over again. I never remembered who did what to whom. Um, and I, I was looking, I was casting around in my mid-30s for what I might want to write. A number of things happened. A friend of mine wrote a mystery. Um, he was a professor of Scandinavian studies at the University of Minnesota. Alan Simpson, um, M.D. Lake, he gave me his book and, and I thought, I loved it. And I thought, well, maybe I should write a mystery. Um, the second thing that happened was someone gave me a copy of Murder in the Collective by Barbara Wilson, which was one of the first um, uh, lesbian mysteries. And uh, I read it and um, I loved it. And I thought, in a way, I think that book gave me permission not to have to write myself out of my books. Um, the Probably the most important thing for me at the time was P.D. James. I used P.D. James um, to help me understand how to construct a mystery. And she was really, I, I think she's what pushed me over the edge to, to write a mystery. Um, back in the mid-80s, they had the P.D. James mysteries on PBS. And, and one series, they interviewed her after each um, episode. And they asked her that question. They said, you know, you're a really wonderful writer. You could, you could have written anything, meaning literature with a capital L. And she, they said, why, why did you write a mystery? And she said, I, and I'll never forget this answer. She said, I thought I would write a mystery. It would teach me how to construct a novel, and then I would move on to the real thing. And then she, she, she said, but I realized very early on that there was nothing that I wanted to write about that I couldn't write about within the context of a mystery. And she always talks about writing with, in the, under the within the moral universe. Um, and I like that because I have a degree in theology. It, it isn't one that I can use, but I'm, I'm interested in those issues. And, I'm, and I've always been really interested. I mean, I think if, you, if, you, if I had to define what a writer was, I would say a writer is curious. We're curious about everything. And one of the things that I'm most curious about is what makes us do what we do. And in a mystery, I think you can make a case that, you know, the, the whodun is always very important. I love the essential nature of any mystery. Mystery is what keeps you reading any book. But I love the why done it of a mystery, too, to try and figure out what makes us do what we do. I think that um, mysteries today have that quality. And so all of those things together, mystery just, it was just too delicious. I mean, that, that's what I wanted to do. If I could segue onto that, too, because, I mean, I, I think about one book uh, that helped me learn how to write. I mean, I, when I was in college and I had this minor as a uh, 
with creative writing. Um, and I did two books, and I, like I said, I finished them both. And one was very nearly published, and uh, it was supposed to be published, and then the uh, the publisher was, or the editor lost her job, and that was the end of that. But um, the book that I learned how to write w from, and I what was missing in both of those books was pace plot, pace and plot, essentially. And the book that I learned from was uh, John le Carre's The Spy Who Came In From the Cold. And I thought, you know, that book, there's not like, it, it's a little book, unlike his later books, uh, which are, you know, so big and so wonderful. But The Spy Who Came In From the, the Cold, each chapter, it's just like, bam, and then bam. And then, you know, it just, it just takes you one, there's everything hooks onto the other. It's like a finely constructed uh, jigsaw puzzle and I read that and I thought oh this is how you 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 get you you know you you construct it this is this is what you know there's so much in writing about what you don't say uh, to uh, and again either in a, in a in a real mystery or in a in a, a regular novel or literature you do have to have that those elements of tension and and uh, and uh, mystery and and intrigue that's the stuff that the books that we really remember uh, that keeps you going along so 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 of Mary Higgins Clark said once that the three main aspects of a mystery are pace plot and character and you know we've talked about this a lot, but what, so is one of those more important than? I've always gone along, I guess, because you know uh, I, I've always thought pace is the most important to me. If you can get somebody going, a lot of people want to go for the ride, and that's what I like. I mean, maybe I'm cheap. I don't know, <laughs> or you know, I mean, I, but you know, then you but then you've got to have the plot. You've got to have the plot to back up the pace. And then the thing that makes a really great book is when you can bring in the characters and they all, I mean, ideally they have to work in harmony. But I think right off the, the bat, I like the, the thing that pops. Now you have a... Well, I mean, Mary Higgins Clark always said that they were like three balls that you had to keep up in the air at all times. And if you dropped one, if your characterizations were bad or your pace dropped or your the plot went nowhere, I mean, you were, you were going to lose a reader. And I, and I really do agree with that. I mean, I, I, th I think that's important. I think books today tend to be more character-driven just because that's what we're kind of used to, except for thrillers. Thrillers are, I don't think most thrillers are character-driven. I think most thrillers are just pace, 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 pace. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I used to lead a, a mystery book group at the St. Paul Public Library, and then I did the same book at the Once Upon a Crime Mystery Bookstore. And uh, one month we read Dennis Lehane's Drink Before the War, and I don't know if you've read Lehane, but he, he wrote Mystic River, he wrote um, Gone Baby Gone, and Shutter Island, okay. The pace is just drop dead, it's just bang, 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 and, 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 and it's, uh, it's easy. It's easy reading, reading and it's, um, I, I think he's a wonderful writer. And then the next month, we read Laurie King's um, Folly. And I, and I started, and Laurie King is also a wonderful writer. And I, and I started that book, and it was so slow. It's about this woman who's building a house on an island. And I just thought, okay, you know, you got to give it a try. It's gotten great reviews. And I just slowed my own thinking down. And I, and I loved that book. I guess... Um, it is all about the ride. It's all about whether that book engages you. And I think the, the one thing for me, pace, plot, and characters, it's all really important. But there's another quality that I didn't discover until, oh, probably 12, 15 books into my writing, and that's the quality of emotion. Is that as a writer, you are trying to direct the emotion of your reader, and to me, that feels like you've got pace, plot, and character. But the cornerstone of any book, I think, is the emotion that it elicits from the reader. That's what I like. Yeah, I, you know, we talk a lot about what categories, and um, I mean, I, I think really the 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 overlying category is crime fiction, and um, if I, I think it, it's it's interesting to talk about the different where the energy comes from in a book. In a mystery, uh, in a typical mystery, there there is a crime that happens 
in the first chapter usually, right up uh, or right up at the front, and then the the energy or the the dynamics of the book come from are we, who's who did it. We f figure it out over the course of the novel, and all these different aspects come into play. With a thriller, uh, usually you know right up at the beginning, uh, you know somebody's going to uh, blow up a building. And then, and we know it, but our um, our protagonist might know it, but doesn't know who did it or who's planning to do it. So the energy comes from: Will they succeed in in stopping this this crime? So they're sort of they work backwards, but they're still all in the crime field. And then you get into what are some of the categories? You name, I mean. Well, there's psychological suspense and medical thrillers. You wrote a medical thriller. Um, Historical Comedic, thrillers, yeah. romantic, right. police procedural, All um, those. Uh, uh, you know, gum amateur th sleuths. Yeah. Um, they're Christian mysteries. They're they're just all kinds of different subgenres. Yeah. So a mystery convention is usually everybody's like, what you know, who are you doing? What are you you know, what are you, what area are you riding in, and so forth. I think it's quite fascinating. But I do think that the more you understand about the the construction and where the energy comes from, then it's like if you know the the boundaries of the pool, it, you need to then you can have a lot of fun floating in that pool. And I think that I mean you can cross over in things, but it, usually you don't. I mean Agatha Christie was a typical mystery writer or the original mystery writer in a way because it was just like bam, somebody you know got killed and then you know you went along until you figured it out. Take another question. Um, What's your writing day like? Uh, okay. What's my writing day like? Um, depends on where I am in a book. Um, I usually spend between two and four hours a day when I'm in a book um, writing. Um, what time do you start writing? I always find that. I'm not, you know, I'm gonna, I, <laughs> because of the way my life works, I tend to stay up late. And so afternoons are the best time for me. I know a lot of people write in the morning and I'm not awake in the morning so and I think that's one of the perks of you know of the profession is that you can just you can write in your pajamas and you don't have to write at 8 a.m. in the morning <laughs> um, you know when I'm when I'm starting a book I, I I'm feeling my way into the book it's much more it's slow uh, and I don't demand a lot from myself in terms of production uh, I feel very much as I'm writing a book I feel very much like I'm I'm moving up a a, uh, like a mountain and at some point because I don't outline we can talk a little bit about that because I don't outline I don't um, necessarily know I know who did it and why but I don't necessarily know how we're gonna get there but at some point in the book at least two-thirds of the way through the book I can see the end and it feels very much like I am just rushing down that hill towards the end of the book and that's that's a very satisfying part of writing the book um, in terms of the actual construction of a novel of a mystery um, there are certain things uh, I've, I've been teaching for 16 years and I find that that mystery that novelists in general tend to divide up into two groups and one is those who outline and the other is those who don't outline and the people who don't outline don't understand how you could write something if you had the outline and the people who do outline don't understand how you get anywhere if you didn't have an outline to work from and kind of never the twain shall meet um, I'm a little bit in the middle there in the sense that when I'm constructing a novel, there's, there are a few things I need to know. I write to a title, so a title always comes first for me. Thematically, I use it to try and understand what that, what that story is going to be about. I always know what the central crime is, who did it, and why. I know the characters that I'm going to surround that crime with. As a mystery writer, you have to cast that net of suspicion equally as, equally as possible over everybody. And then... I need to, you know, I may know a few twists that I'm going to write to. I may know some of the humor that I want to use, or I may know, you know, a few of the major plot points. I know the hook chapter, which is that first chapter that's supposed to grab you and pull you into the novel. And I know the first couple of chapters. It's very much like writing, uh, driving on a road at night. You don't necessarily see from your garage to the restaurant, but you have headlights. And for me, those headlights are those chapters that I can see ahead. I'm always writing towards something, but I don't necessarily see the entire road. So do you outline a couple chapters ahead? Yeah, as far as I can see ahead, I will. 
continue. Do you outline, I mean, do you keep a notebook? Then? Yeah, yeah, I keep a running list of notes on, you know, this chapter, I know this is the, the plot point that I have. I, you know, you, you write based on scenes, Every scene has to have a plot point. You have, every scene has to deliver some new piece of information so to the reader. So do you do it? I'm, I'm, I don't know this. How long have I have known you for 20 years? Do you do it with post-it or post-it notes no, or I'd cards? No, I keep it on my desktop. Just at my computer desktop. Uh, okay, so you're just yeah. writing, right? Right. And yeah. so you know, if I can see, if I start and I know the first three chapters, I'm working towards that. As I'm getting to the third chapter, I may see two or three more chapters ahead. I'm starting to think. So I outline as I go along, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a writing journal. Am I supposed to segue in? Yes. This is, okay. uh, I have a writing journal that I work in, and so I'm sort of halfway outline and I halfway don't. And I, one of the hardest things for me about writing is just being alone and not being able to talk with anyone. I'm working on a, televi a proposal for a television show uh, right now, and um, so my writing partner comes over and we just sort of like ha have a cup of coffee and walk around the room. We could do this or we could do that. And we walk around and he goes, this has been a really hard writing day. And I'm going like, this is not writing. This is like coffee and talking. You know, I mean, it, you know, we haven't done anything. I mean, it, writing is, you know, putting, you know, 5,000 down, uh, 5,000 words down on a, on a page. That's writing being by yourself. But um, I have a writing journal, and I sit down, and I write in it, and I th it usually starts out, okay, I have this idea for this book, w I want to do a book on this, and what's this book about? And I tr keep pulling at it, and I keep stretching it, and, and you know, uh, trying to write out, okay, it could be about this, or it could go there, or, uh, you know, um, you know, and and so I'm usually about six to ten. I have an outline about six to ten chapters ahead of where I am, um, but it's like a roadmap because I could be three more chapters into it, and then just tear that up and and you know it's it's like going to France and saying I'm going to go to this city, this city, and this city, but then you get to that city and you want to take a left, and you have to have the freedom to be able to do that. So. Uh, that's kind of the way I do it. Is my question. Well, no, well, writing day, but I mean, so how did you work late in the, at, at night to go? <coughs> I used to. I'm getting too old. I get, t I get, uh, you know, I'm tired in the morning and I'm tired at night, so I've got the afternoon to work. Um, I do some writing at night, but uh, you know, I um, afternoons are really the best time for me, and I, you know, I. I try and do a chapter a day, and I, and that is you know that is has no meaning for anybody other than for How many me. How pages? Is well, you... you know, it's usually anywhere from five to seven pages. That's a lot. It's um, between fifteen hundred and two thousand words. Yeah. That's what I shoot for. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I I think that. Uh, how do you write? Do you write pages per day then, or words per day, or hours at your desk per day? I can't do hours at my desk per day. I, you know, I have to produce, and even you, you know, as a as a working writer, you can't wait for inspiration. I mean, you've got a deadline, you've got a contract, and um, and that this is kind of an awful thing. One of my favorite writers really is Dennis Lehane, and he wrote a series for many years, and I think he wrote five in that series. And when the fifth book came out. He said he saw it in the window of a Barnes and Noble, and he said it was that moment I realized how it should have ended. And you know, when you're working on a, con a contract on a deadline, and you get a Commercial Speed New York is a book a year, um, you you only you have a limited period of time in which to write that book. So, um, what was the question? I mean, then, <laughs> I don't know, but length the. the the length of time that I write. Well, I, yeah, I, I write in the afternoons and, um, and it takes me four, four to five months to rough out a book. Yeah. Um, and then, then multiple, multiple, multiple revisions. Yeah. I don't think, a, I think a book really doesn't take shape. And for me, um, if there are other writers here, for instance, I'm thinking of my friend Kent, Kent Kruger. Do you all know who he is? William Kent Kruger, he's a Minnesota writer. He, he, he outlines. And one of the reasons he outlines is because he absolutely loathes revisions. 
So for him, he knows what's going to happen in every chapter. Uh, he doesn't have to write in a linear way. He, you know, from chapter one through chapter 30, he can pick any chapter he wants to. Um, well, that's interesting because I love to rewrite. Rewriting is so much easier than writing because, you know, um, you've got um, everything down on paper and then you can go back and cut it apart and put it back together a different way. Um, the, the Kitchen Boy, that uh, the first in my Russian historical novels, um, I had this idea that I was going to write, you know, historical novel, which I'd not done before, about the last days of the Romanovs. And um, I, uh, I did the book, and it was 460 pages long, and I couldn't sell it. It went out 15 times. Uh, to 15 different publishers. And I thought, how is this possible? I mean, how long have I been writing? What do I do? And um, then I hired my old editor, and uh, and she said, oh, Dolly, you got to cut the damn thing in half. And um, she said I had it alternating between present chap uh, the present time and historical time. So I just put it all out on the floor, you know, every other chapter, and then I just went through and picked up every other chapter and took took it out and that took it down to 230 pages where and then it sold I had three offers in a week <laughs> but um but you know I mean there was it took me about a month to sort of weave all those chapters together but it is all a process and I don't think it gets any easier you know and this is it they're very it's very interesting reading time and writing time now I don't know you know with the the ad I don't know why I'm going in this. Can I go in this direction about present day publishing? Sure. I mean, it's changed a lot it's cha and I think it needed to change. I think that I miss going into old bookstores, but you know, as a writer, um, you know, all the wonderful bookstores, it, it was, you know, essentially every book in a bookstore is there on consignment because they can be returned or stripped when they rip off a cover of a paperback, which is like the darkest days of any writer's. Uh, you know, it's like you go into a bookstore, it's like, oh, yeah, you're R.D. Zimmerman. I just stripped your books last week. And it was like, oh, you know. Um, but uh, it's changed a lot, and it's it's interesting, and it's empowering, and it's just different. It is. Uh, you know, with the e-books, um, being out there and the accessibility and, the, and, 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 and so on and how to get it. It's a whole new world of, of, of changing. Um, I'm, I, for the last three or four years, I've been sitting on the National Board of Sisters in Crime, which is a mystery writers organization. And a couple of years ago, they sent the, a few members of the board out to Silicon Valley and up to um, Seattle to, um, um, to visit. We visited Google. Amazon, Apple, and Smashwords. And honestly, that was just a revelation to me. I, at the time, I, I had um, e-books that were up. E-books really weren't on my, my radar. And I had a lot of books that had reverted to me in terms of, you know, the, the rights, and they, didn't, they, they weren't published anymore. You couldn't find them anymore. Being out in California and seeing all the energy in, in digital um, writing uh, and publishing, it was like being out in the Wild West. It was like being in the Klondike. There was, everybody was doing something, and there was all this energy. I came home and I put, I think, 11 of my books up as e-books. And, you know, it's, it is a completely new world. It's, it's vastly more complex. Um, I just, I just, uh, Audible... I love to read uh, by listening to uh, um, uh, audio books. Audible just came to my, you know, I keep thinking I'm going to get dropped by my press and that's going to be the end of my writing career. Well, Audible just came to my, my agent and they want to buy 16 of my books to put up as as audiobooks. So it's like I keep limping along. <laughs> um, so many of my friends have been have been dropped. I mean, it's just a a completely... It's not really even a business model anymore. Nobody knows how any of this is going to shake out. If there will even be books. The great thing, though, you know, you've got your books up there now that nobody could get it. Yes. Their, get their hands on before. Yeah, nobody knew, you know, 10, 12 years ago, really, what 
electronic rights were. Right. And I mean, I when I did uh, the gay mystery series, Todd Mills, my uh, lawyer looked at him and she said, electronic rights, who the hell knows what that is? And That's she right. scratched him out of all my contracts. So now I've been able to, which is great because I retained him. And so, uh, uh, so you know, I mean, it was very fortunate for me because I spent last year putting up a bunch, I've got 14 of my books up there, which is, I mean, when you've got a body of work that, you know, the books are out of, uh, out of print. And, that and so we talk back and forth weekly, and what are you selling? <laughs> um, Random House did, uh, did an electronic grab. And they just, you, you couldn't get a contract from Random House unless you allowed them to have all electronic rights. And who knew what that was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It is, it, it you know, are we going to have bookstores? And so many bookstores have closed. Um, are, how, how is this all going to look? Uh, I, I like to still have a physical book, but I have an e-reader. Do you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I get book, I buy books, and, but then when I travel, it's great to be able to read it on my iPad. You know, um, I find that the reading experience for me is different electronically. I read much more quickly and perhaps too quickly. Uh, I, you know, sitting down, I mean, I can read really quickly that way. So I do, I do a lot of uh, library events um, around the country. And maybe s seven years ago, you'd go to a small town and, and, and you would say, um, who here has a, an e-reader or an iPad or something like that? And not only did they not have them, but it was kind of like um, they would hiss at you. Like, we like books. We're, you know, we're not going to do any of this digital stuff. Now it's very different. We, we, I just did seven uh, small towns up in the northwestern part of the state. Greenbush and Thief River Falls. And you, you go to these places now, and it's usually an older group of people, and you say, do you have an e-reader? And it's like, yeah. And the reason is, there are two ma major reasons. Number one, you can, you can adjust the text size. So if you have trouble reading, that's not a problem anymore. And number two, these small towns, they don't have bookstores. You know, if, and one thing I like in the middle of the night, if I find a book because I can't sleep and I want that book, I have that book in three minutes. And these people who can't find bookstores, they have, they have automatic access. So, you know, this stuff is, is gradually catching on. Tell us what you're working on now. Okay. Uh, gonna, that's another yeah, question. Yeah, it's another, what were you going to ask? Uh, no, that's fine. It's on um, your list. It is. Um... I'm working on the next Jane Lawless book. Uh, it's called Taken by the Wind, and I'm about two-thirds of the way through it. Um, it's due in February. I'm a little behind. Um, and I'm very excited about it. Um, what else am I working on? I'm teaching. And you've got a book that just came I have, Oh, well, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm not very good at The one question yeah. you can always ask her, you have a new book that just came out. She yeah. goes, I had two or three this year. Yeah, like no, that. no, I have a book that just came out in uh, October. It's called Rest for the Wicked, and it's getting some great reviews. So what about you? Um, you know, I, I am, my life is in flux right now. Uh, and that's, I'm trying to say, okay, it's good to be in flux because I, um, I did the, the Russian books and they're, um, I've been very distracted by, uh, and, and pretty much involved. They're working on a film of the kitchen boy and, um, it's been very fun to be involved in. I talk to the producer a few times a week, uh, and that, you know, it's like last week we had all of our fin financing and it was shooting next in, in this March and then this week we've lost 40% of our financing and you know I mean it goes forward but then there's another meeting on Friday it's very very interesting um, and it's been very uh, fun to be involved uh, in transferring you know the uh, the story to film and there's some very very wonderful uh, people working on it um, uh, uh, Ronald Harwood who did the pianist and the diving bell and the du butterfly has done the screenplay for it. So it's just been, you know, we'll see if it ever, I thought writing a book was hard. This is really hard. Um, uh, so I've uh, done that. And then I did an ebook original called uh, When Dad Came Back as My Dog. Uh, and uh, so that's now up uh, uh, 
uh, up on you know on Amazon as an ebook, um, and so I've been doing that, and it's like okay, it's time to really get back to writing. So uh, I I think I was just pooped after a long time, and I wanted to get back uh, to finding the joy of writing, of of finding the joy of creating, of 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 dreaming that way. So um, I have a, an idea for. Um and I, and I think I probably talked to you about it. It's kind of a metaphysical mystery yeah. of sorts. And it, it would not be part of uh, the series. And I don't know whether I could sell it. And I don't know how I'm going to fit it in, in terms of time. Um, but of, of anything that has, you know, when you're writing, you have all these ideas that come to you. And ultimately, one outshouts the other. And that's the one that you work on. Um, this is this is a book that's been shouting at me for so many years, and I just have not found the time to write it. And I'm I'm I am hoping to to somehow work a six month period into my next contract so that I can maybe have some time to actually f physically get my hands on that idea. Where do you get your ideas? <laughs> I just find that I know we always get that question. We always say, yeah, we got that question. But I love I love hearing that from other writers. I find it fascinating. Where do you find, you know, a stone of all the stones out there? Why is it that one that you pick up and turn into a book? You know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, it's a perennial question. I'll tell you a little story. Um, in uh, 1994, I was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. And I thought, well, that's the end of me. I was, my career is just getting started. And and I was quite ill, and um, they sent me back to the doctor, and the doctor decided that maybe it wasn't terminal lung cancer. And so, you know, so they sent me to have some tests. And one of the tests they sent me to have was a colonoscopy. Now, I don't know if any of you have had the joy of, <laughs> of that particular test, but I remember the day that I, that I went there to have that test, and I don't know how the, the doctor who was performing it found out that I was a writer, but somehow he had found that out. And he realized, I think, that I was having a little more than the discomfort, slight discomfort that you're supposed to have when this test occurs. And he leaned over me while he was doing it, and he said, I hear you're a writer, so where do you get your ideas? <laughs> And it was at that moment I decided I was going to kill a doctor. <laughs> and did you? Oh, yeah. And I've gone on to many other <laughs> occupations since. <laughs> any, any writer who, does, who tells you that they're not using their writing as therapy is lying to you. <laughs> Where do you get your ideas? Well, I, you know, you never know when it's going to come to you or what you were going to, you know, anything. Like for the, uh, when Dad came back as my dog, I was walking around, uh, Lake of the Isles, and I was walking with my dog, and and uh, my dad died uh, 45 years ago, and I was talking to my dog, and you know, saying, you know, like, do you know how good you have it? And I said, in my next life, I want to come back as my dog, and then I so I, I just sort of thought, you know, what would happen if somebody that you lost, you know, you could have them back, and what would you say, and what would avenues would you explore? Um, when I did The Kitchen Boy, I was reading a journal, or Alexandra's actually uh, uh, last page of her diary, uh, and it was republished, found in the archives uh, in the Soviet Union and republished. And I got to the, like, the last paragraph, and she talked about how suddenly and oddly The Kitchen Boy was taken, uh, Leon Kosednyov, was taken away from the house, and this was about three hours before they were murdered uh, or executed. So they were, uh, she wrote about this kitchen boy, and he was removed, and then they were killed. And everybody talks about how was, there's no, there was no witness uh, to uh, the house's special purpose. And I thought, wait a minute, there was this kid, and he was, saw everything for the last, the previous year, up to three out of the last three hours he missed. And I thought, you know, we know he lived another day. We know he lived another week. What, and then eventually I got to the point, what if he were alive and well and living in Chicago, Illinois? And it's not that far-fetched of a, you know, there was a Romanov princess um, who died uh, two years ago at age 103 in Lake Forest, Illinois. I mean, these pe there are these people that take these great leaps of time. And that is the, the what-if thing is what I find, you know, the fun thing to pull, 
pull at? You know, what if I, I could talk to my dad? What if I, what if there was really a, an eyewitness to that? What would they be able to tell us that we don't know? And how would they bring it to life? And you, you just don't, you know, I get a lot of ideas from walking when I'm walking or taking a shower. Um, it's, what if, you know, the, that the, the, the theory of 80 beats per cycle of just this monotonous highway hypnosis where you go into another dream state kind of thing. You know, um, one of the most interesting things I've done, I think, as a writer is watch you write The Kitchen Boy. Because it took, I know, <laughs> and he nearly had a nervous breakdown over it. But, I mean, you wrote that over a couple, two years, two, three years, something like that. And he, he had, that book had so many incarnations. And it was, what point of view do I tell this from? I mean, these are all such really, they're major questions when you're writing a book. And, and who's important in this book? And, and what's the story in this book? And what, I mean, there, if you haven't read The Kitchen Boy, it's, it's probably the best thing you've ever written. It, um, ph phenomenal book. Um, so much emotion and, and, and it would make a great movie. But that, to me, that was just utterly fascinating. I remember, and I remember we talked about this at the time, um, Memoirs of a Geisha, mm -hmm. the guy who wrote that book, uh, he he did it from I don't know how many points of view, and none of them worked. And all the time he was writing this book, um, people were saying, "But you can't do it from the standpoint of a geisha, because you're a man, and you can't write from the standpoint of of a, of a geisha." And the book didn't work for him until he wrote from that from the standpoint of the geisha. And you know, it's it, all of these writing, these these aspects of writing a novel are to me so utterly fascinating. What what makes what gives a book that special magic, you know, and how do you get that into the book? Well, and we always talk about whose whose story is this, and who's telling the story. They could be enti two entirely different people. Two, you know, I think really, and I think that was one of the best pieces of advice I got early on is to have them be one and the same. Yeah. In in a, a, as a young writer, make sure that who's. Who, this person who's telling the story is actually going through the story. Because when you have these separate things, it takes a lot of coordination to keep everything in sync and the momentum and the story and all of that. Do we need to go to questions? Yeah. I, I, I hate to because I'm fascinated. I'm enjoying the conversation so much. But And I don't know. Yes, this mic is working now. Um, do any of you have questions that you'd like to ask Artie or Ellen that we could? Yes. After 20 plus books, what's keeping you going? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I feel so lucky. Um, I, I love writing. I, I've done a lot of things in my life. I mean, I, I spent the majority of my life, I suppose, as my early life as a, as, a, as a cook, as a chef, and I'd still love that. But working with words, not every day, and, and not all the time, but enough of the time, when I can write something and I know that I nailed it, that I, that I was able to express exactly what I wanted to express, that I did something exactly right, that is such a rush. I think that's what keeps writers writing, because it's certainly it's not the money. It's, it's, um, it's hard work. Um, it's hard mental work, but I, and, and, and the days when it's not coming, it's so frustrating, but on the days when it does come on those times when, you know, four hours flies by and instead of writing three paragraphs, you've written 15 pages, doesn't happen a lot, but when that happens, it is so intoxicating. I think it's, it's, that keeps you going. I would agree. I just love making stuff. Yeah. You know, and that, I mean, we talk a lot about what we're making for dinner, but, uh, but I mean, I love making, I do stonework or I do anything like that of taking, the thing that drives me to write is taking something disparate and putting it together and creating something entirely different. And I get such a buzz out of that. And, you know, just like, wow, it's like, I feel like I get, you know, it's like getting a gold star or something. Yes. <laughs> you have other questions?
One of the things that I like a lot about mysteries is the local color, and neither one of you has talked about local color. Well, you know, research to me and local color is really, I mean, I love doing that. I love, you know, uh, you know, you went down the street and you turned left and you can name the street and you're accurate on it. And it, you can't make a mistake on that kind of stuff. If you set a book in the Twin Cities, you know, I mean, obviously you can't have, you know, Lake Calhoun by the University of Minnesota. I mean, it just would ruin the whole book. But, um, you know, you do, I think that you do have to write a book, any book, and that's what I tried to do with the Russian books, with, uh, as an eyewitness, because they're, the readers are too smart. Uh, readers are too, uh, they're not, I mean, they're just too engaged. They know, you know, and they want, you know, and you, it, local color just makes, makes it. And um, you want to be sure that you're, using stuff appropriate to that day and age, not only in terms of like the seasons and the, the smells and the, and you know, I mean, you know, Gary has, you know, if you'd be writing about Gary, you don't, you could be talking about the clear days in Gary in the sixties as an anomaly. And then you would know that that person had really been there. You know, you wouldn't, you know, you know something like that. I mean, it really brings it to life and engages you. I mean, you do, you've got a series, I mean, well, I mean, your books are set, you know, with... Uh... One series is set mainly in St. Paul, and the other is set mainly in Minneapolis. And, um, you know, I mean, setting is so critical, I think, to, to any good writing. I think it actually becomes a character in the writing. Um, when I started, I, I had read enough mysteries that I knew that I was really sick of mysteries that were only set in Chicago or L.A. or New York, as if those were the only places where dead bodies happen, <laughs> you know, it just is not true. And I, and, you know, someone m mentioned once that there's this term domestica exotica, that we really like to, well, we, we, that it's ex our own, for those who live in the Twin Cities, it's not exotic, but for people who live out of the, tw uh, out of the, the Minnesota, you know, you set, you set a mystery on a lake in a, in a, in a cabin or something like that. That is, that's very exotic. It is, and I love that. Um, I I love. I think setting you. I I can remember one book that I that I very early on learning how important setting was. That I had the idea for the book. I had the title for the book. I had some of the characters. I knew what the. I knew kind of what the the crime was. And you took me down to the um, warehouse district. And you sh you showed me because Lar your partner Lars is an architect, and he had told you about some of these buildings down there that actually had uh, caves that went out to the to the water because in times past to the Mississippi th they brought they brought food and they brought um, various things in that way and they'd bring them through these caves into the building and that's you know I just thought. That was the coolest thing I could even, I couldn't believe what a gift that was. Do you remember that? You probably, oh, yeah. okay. And, um, and I remember sitting on the couch when I got that idea, when I realized that that was the setting, it was like watching this crystal forming. The whole, the whole, the whole book just sort of took shape because you had taken me to that setting. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's about like adding spice. Yeah. And, and instead of having something bland, it's about seasoning it properly. Mm -hmm. I agree. They're, they're both threatening to kill off someone in those caverns now after our tour this evening. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I put in my pitch. I said, please not the curator. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have questions for... whose blog I read, I don't actually particularly like his books. Um, and he's straight, and he has two main series. And in one of the series, one of the three protagonists is a lesbian, and in the other series, the protagonist is bisexual. And I was just thinking, only a straight author could do that and still have a mainstream audience. Do you think that's true? Who's the author? Jim Butcher. I don't know. Fantasy writer. A oh, fantasy writer, okay. I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I have students. Um, this is one of my students. Um, come to me very often and say, you know, I'm I'm going to write. I, I'm writing this mystery, and I want to have a gay main character, or I want to have a major character be gay or lesbian. And will that hurt my sales? And 
you know, I have to tell them the truth, and the truth is probably, you know, that that's probably the, the case. You have to make that decision. Well, I think that to add on to that, though, I mean, people like to read about things that they, you know, I mean, that they can relate to. And I don't think that it, we, if you have a gay or lesbian novel, you might lose readership, not because people are homophobic, particularly, you know, these days, um, but because they like to be able to relate to, help me here, you know what I mean. Well, I think there's still homophobia around. Well, there and is, I, and but I, I mean, I think you also like to read about, you know, I mean, I'm not going to read a romance right. novel, right? you know, because I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested in reading about, you know, going off, sailing off with... That's right. That's why I wouldn't read Herzog when I was in my 20s. I didn't want to read about a 50-year-old guy. Yeah. No interest <laughs> at all. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but, I, but uh, um, I think you're seeing more and more gay and lesbian characters in books. Um, but, I, but I, you know, all I can say is that I know there, are, there have been in the past other lesbian writers that have lesbian mystery series through mainstream uh, New York presses. There aren't any now except me. I'm the last one standing. And I, you know, I hope that 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 changes very, very quickly. But, you know, I, I'm not going to hold my breath. I think I think New York's there's still major bias in New York. There's a very, very healthy small press community, thankfully. Let me come back to Mark and then I'll come right back to you. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the effect of the movies and also the internet on writing today. On what? Movies I, and internet. On writing. Film. Film and internet. Well, you know what scares me? My biggest fear as a writer right now is that people, um, we get so much information uh, and we get it so quick and we get it in such bits that I think people are reading differently now than they were even five five years ago. I mean, I I still get the Star Tribune and the New York Times every day, but increasingly I have read about something, you know, like the day before, but I've only read about it in a little bit, like in a little thing on the internet, and I think, oh, I don't need to read that story. Well, the story might be, you know, two columns long. And I think that um, reading getting people to sit down and read a book is, um, is, uh, a gift and a, a, it's a gift. It's a skill. It's a learned thing. It's, um, and I think that the internet, uh, is changing how people want their entertainment moment being taken up. I mean, I know I've spent evenings, uh, Thinking around on the, you know, looking at this and going to that on the computer and clicking here and clicking that. And I think, why wasn't I sitting down reading a book? You know. Um, uh, first, um, film, I think film has had a huge uh, impact on how we write and on what we want to read today. We, you know, you read a Victorian novel and it is, you know, we just it, we're not set up for that anymore. We want things quick. We want we want things paced. Even even literary novels. Um, I'm finding. I just started Louise Erdrich's book, The Round House. That book is so gripping from the beginning. I mean, it's like I was racing just to find out what happened. She knows how to write, and that's literary fiction. Um, I think that that film has done that to us. That that's what we want. Um, as far as the internet, I will recommend a book to you, which I think is. Again, an, another really interesting read, and it's um, nonfiction. It's called The Shallows, and it's um, how the internet is affecting us as, you know, even evolutionarily. When when the printing press started, you know, Gutenberg, um, it changed us as as human. It changed human beings. We we lost our capacity for memory. We we used to have much better capacity to me to memorize and to be able to. Uh, our memories were, were better. Now we don't have to use our memory like that anymore because we can have it in a book. Um, the internet is changing us, it, and it's, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, you know, it's like when someone asked Henry Kissinger, what do you think the, the 
what's, what do you think happened in the French Revolution? How, you know, how did that affect us? And he said, it's too early to tell. Um, it's, you know, these are, these are, we have to take the long view of some of this stuff, but it is changing us. Um, we don't read so much anymore like this. We read and then we go down. We're, you, we, our eyes scan differently. Um, I don't know how this is all going to shake out, and I do think it's, it's going to affect us. In terms of just publishing in the internet, I think what we have lost and what, we are, what we're, we're losing is the gatekeepers. If people, anybody can publish anything they want at any time, and it all gets thrown up there, um, how do you know if it's any good or not? We used to have presses that were our gatekeepers. And if, if they put, you know, if they were willing to publish it, that meant chances are that it had some value. Um, today, the, gate, the gatekeepers are breaking down. I, I don't know how this will shake out. We'll do uh, one last question. First of all, it was Jim C. Hines, not Jim Busher, but that's not what I wanted to say. Um, there's this other young adult writer I read, whose blog I read who says that part of the problem with young adult fiction is that people expect that girls will read books with boy protagonists, but they don't expect that boys will read books with girl protagonists. And I was wondering if you thought the same might be true with gay and lesbian and bisexual protagonists. We've Wait talked about this. <laughs> <laughs> we have two more hours. I know, you know. No, I don't know what to say. I think, well, the, I did. I don't even know if I even want to go into the theory. Um, the theory is that there's the power ladder. Yeah. And the power ladder is, uh, you know, if you have the straight white male at the top, then everybody will, below will read going up. And it's where you see another, you know, if you're female or gay or lesbian or whatever, I mean, is the person... You'll read somebody above you, but not below. How about that for being? I, I don't know. I, I don't know either. We talked about it, and I don't, I'm not sure I believe that, but it's. I, th I think there is this, you know, I mean, I don't think probably too many people would disagree with the fact that anything that is written by a man or, or about men or boys is universal. And anything that's written by a woman about women or girls is sort of a niche marketed thing, you know, it's, it's the other. And, you know, I don't, I wish I saw that changing more. I don't see it changing. It did change a lot, a lot in the eighties. It did, but I'm not like sure. With, with Sarah Paretsky and yeah. Sue Grafton. I mean, there, there used to be no female PIs. And then all yes. of a sudden with Sarah Paretsky. Yes. And that was just a huge market. And but the reviews, I've gone back there, there, men get reviewed like, Enormous. Still? Oh yeah, it, the '80s it changed. I remember going to a bookstore and seeing a book, uh, all, all all these mysteries in, a, in in the bookcase, and they were all by women. I think there was one man, and I thought that's a bad thing, because you know we don't need, we we need some parity. We don't necessarily need all women or all men, and it has you know for a long time the 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 bullets, bodies, booze, blondes, and blood pi was out of favor now it's all back again you know it's it we seem to be cyclical and i don't i don't know i don't know how much it, we have you know well, i think it's getting better all right <laughs> yes okay i'd like to thank both Artie and ellen for their generosity and uh for letting us listen in on their conversation this evening <laughs> <laughs>